learning subject, the cornea would be clear and you'd be able to see the pupil clearly with the cataract sitting behind the pupil, the, the white opacity. To see how so couching stands to, the test of time, uh, I'm meeting up with eye surgeon Mr Vic Sharma. Right, the cataract is the, um, the lens inside the eye which sits behind the pupil. Um, right. As with time, with age, the cataract, the lens gets cloudier and cloudier and that's what is referred to as a cataract. Okay. Um, I've the, brought along a replica of a medieval couching knife and a description of the treatment by al Bukhasis, which is the Latin name for the great 10th century Islamic surgeon al Zahrawi. Uh, he says you take the couching needle in your right hand, if it be the left eye and so on, and then yep. thrust the needle firmly in, at the same time rotating it with your hand until it penetrates the white of the eye and you feel the needle has reached something empty. Uh, so he's talking about how to dislodge. Exactly. So, I mean, maybe you can show me. We've got well, some eyes here. Yep, yep, and, and I'll certainly give it a shot. And what they would have done would have attempted to go in just by the white of the eye, just at the edge where the cornea is. And then what they are attempting to do is to sweep around trying to break all those ligaments right. of that lens and trying to get the lens to drop away from the pupil to allow more light to enter in through the pupil and to brighten the subject's vision. But, of course, you haven't got the capacity to focus. Oh, yeah, you haven't got a lens now, yeah. so that was a big problem until right. people started compensating that with specs later on. Right, right. What is your feeling about how advanced and successful... Well, they were on the, you know, the, the general ballpark. They, they were at the right place. You know, they were yeah. they were trying to remove the cataract away from the visual axis. They understood um, so the anatomy of exactly, the eye. Exactly. They had some understanding of the anatomy of the eye, and you know that the lens was behind the pupil, and that's what was causing the um, visual loss. And so, removing that, um, you know, and that general principle is still the same. Right. And you know, uh, there are still accounts of it being used in certain parts of the world presently. Looking back at medieval Islamic medicine with modern scientific eyes is frustrating. They take as true many things we know to be nonsense. But on the other hand, their desire to deal with this vast subject logically and systematically is admirable and truly marks a break with the past. One Islamic scholar more than any other embodies the synthesis of religion, faith and reason. His name was Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, as he's known in the West. He was a polymath who clearly thrived in intellectual and courtly circles. In 1025, he completed this, Al-Qanun fil tib or the Canon of Medicine. In it, Ibn Sina collated and expanded on all that had gone before him, medical ideas from Greece to India, and turn them into a single work. So how would you place this book in a historical context? Oh, it's hugely important. I mean, it's, uh, I mean there are a few books which are as important as the canon because uh, what this encyclopedia does, it kind of you know, sweeps away everything else. It becomes a textbook. Uh, it, be it supersedes a lot of other texts. And people even complain that you know, like, uh, it's so good, it's so tightly organized, it's so easily accessible that uh, you know, like people forget to read the, the Greek sources in Arabic translations. This whole first book, this is the first book, contains what we call the kuliyat, the general principles. So it's all about how the human body works, you know, how diseases work in general. Mm -hmm. The second book uh, contains uh, diseases, so what we call, sometimes call from tip to toe, you know, like from tip to toe, so he starts with the diseases of the head, and then he moves, moves down like the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth. And he, he normally they end up at the sexual organs, you see. At first sight, the sheer ambition of the three volumes is hugely impressive. Here's an attempt at diagnosis and cure for diseases as diverse as depression, meningitis and smallpox. And there's even detailed chapters on more common problems. So, um, like for instance here you have like headaches. So different kinds of yeah. headaches. So headaches caused by pleasant fragrant right. smells. Or, and then yeah. he's also got um, uh, al-hadith mil khimar, so um, mm. um, hangovers. Mm. Different oh, jima. You can get headache from sex. So. Is that right? Uh, well, I mean, it <laughs> hasn't happened to me yet, but I mean, you know. <laughs> Let's see. So. 
the treatment of headache caused by sex. ويجب لمن يعتريه ذلك عقب الجماع وبامتلاء أن يبدأ بالفاست. So if somebody uh, has or is befallen by suffers from a headache after sex and he also has a repletion, so he like he has too many superfluities or something like that. Um, so يجب أن يبدأ بالفاست. One has to first resort to venesection or bloodletting. ثم بالإسهال. And then you should, should use purging in wajaba kullu wahidin minhuma. For each, both of them, I mean like bloodletting and purging are necessary. A lot of the stuff in here sounds like nonsense, of course, oh. because this is not modern mm. medicine. No, it's not. Um, so how long was, was this taken seriously? Well, the fundamental ideas contained here about how the body works, I mean, they haven't changed until the early 19th century. I mean, there was, there were, there was progress, obviously, on certain levels, but the, you know, like the essence was the same. And then came the big break with the discovery of bacteria and, uh, and viruses and things like that. And from the second half of the 19th century onward, you know, medicine was totally revolutionized. Ibn Sina's canon of medicine is a landmark in the history of the subject. Although much of the medical science it espouses we know now to be terribly misguided, its value lies in accumulating the best knowledge in the world at the time into one accessible, organized text. The canon would give future generations something to rewrite. Cataloguing the world's medical knowledge has clear and obvious benefits. But the Islamic Empire's obsession to uncover the knowledge of the ancients went beyond practical matters like medicine. Many, like the Caliph al Ma'mun, believed that the people of antiquity possessed dark, even magical powers. And what's more, new evidence is coming to light to show just how hard Islamic scientists worked to rediscover them.